All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. We have a great panel for you guys today for our Girls and Women's in Sports Day. My name is Chelsea Raleigh. I am the Director of Marketing here in the Athletic Department. I'm joined by our Ticketing Manager, Amanda Goodwin. And we have three of our lovely female student athletes to talk a little bit about um, some things here in the Athletic Department and celebrate women in sports. First, we have Claire Larson, a member of the women's swimming and diving team, ranks within the top 10 all time in both the 100 and 200 freestyle in Columbia Records books. She's also a championship finalist and placed sixth in the 200 free at the Ivy League Championship. Claire, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. And we have Max Ortega, a member of the softball team, most recently made first team all Ivy and second team time Ivy player of the week. Congratulations. As a sophomore was ranked in the top 100 in the NCAA for bat batting average and led the Ivy League in total RBIs run scored and hits. Amazing. Thank you so much, Max. We really appreciate it. And last but certainly not in least, we have Sienna Durr from the women's basketball team, named Ivy League Rookie of the Year in 2019, as well as all Metropolitan Women's D1 Rookie of the Year. And she currently holds the Columbia first year scoring record at 392 points. Thank you so much, Sienna. We really appreciate you being here. And now I'm going to kick it over to my partner in crime, Amanda, and she is going to tell you a little bit more about today. Thanks, Chels. Um, our student athletes today are going to cover uh, a variety of topics surrounding girls and women in sports. And we also have a very special guest here to host. Her name is Pepper Persley. Pepper is a local journalist who is just nine years old, hosts two shows, Dish with Pepper and She Got Next, regularly hosting go, um, guests from the WNBA and Division I women's basketball pro programs. Pepper, thank you so much for joining us. Are you ready to get us started? I am absolutely ready. Um, I'm so excited for this opportunity. And Amanda, thank you so much for that introduction. Well, I want to thank all those who submitted questions for this event. Many were submitted and we'll try to integrate as many as possible. Well, let's start off with one, all, one of those questions. What do you think is the biggest obstacle in driving the importance of women's sports? Let's start with Claire. Um, I think biggest obstacle um, is definitely exposure. What about Max? I think the biggest obstacle is um, representation amongst um, different communities of um, people. And Sienna? I think just like what Claire and Max said, I think it's definitely visibility and representation. Well, I think we saw a common theme there surrounding the importance of representation. As many of you are probably familiar with the mantra, if you can see her, you can be her. With that in mind, we'd like to ask the audience a question. What percentage of sports media is about women? And Max, what do you think? go with 15 percent and Claire yeah I, I do agree I think it's on the low side and Sienna I also agree I think it's probably low probably 15 I hope not four I hope not <laughs> well yeah sadly it seems like all of these are under 50 percent which really sucks oh and the results are in it seems like everybody chose three 38 percent that is not correct and sadly the actual answer is four percent which really really stinks and there needs to be more more coverage of women's sports but hopefully we'll get there someday with that in mind max we are growing what were you um when you were growing up and participating in sports who was your favorite athlete or role model and was it female yeah, so it was um, Jessica Mendoza. She is a softball player as well. Uh, she is actually, she was an Olympian, uh, was a softball player at Stanford, and now she is currently doing social media uh, on, and um, for baseball. So she's the first woman, uh, yeah, she's the first woman announcer to be um, in baseball history. Oh, that's so cool. And I'm so glad that you were able to find a female softball player to look up to. That's so awesome. And Sienna, what about you? 
For me growing up, you could say I kind of grew up in like a soccer household. That was what was always on TV. And I loved watching the U.S. women's national soccer team. So you have like Abby Wambach, Alex Morgan, Christine Press. I loved all of them and I loved watching their games. So I definitely looked up to them growing up. And last but not least, Claire. Yeah, I actually played soccer for 15 years before I switched over to swimming like last minute. So I don't, um, I really also looked up to a lot of women um, soccer players. Abby Wambach was one of them for sure. <laughs> and let's keep it with Claire. Did you feel like you had female athletes to look up to or was it hard to find role models that were women? I know you mentioned one, but did you feel that there were more? Yeah, so um, that's a really good question. I think that in, ath in athletics, um, when I was growing up, it was hard for me just through exposure. Like you just don't really see that a lot. Um, and like the first question you asked, um, like why, why do like why do we think it's difficult to see women in sports? Um, you're just kind of so pressed with men's sports that it becomes the thing to watch, you know. And so I think it's hard to kind of see women mentors um, for young girls. Um, so yeah, I really looked up to the women in my family. Uh, I have a really, a lot of strong women in my family. And so um, they really like pushed me and shaped me, but there aren't that many female mentors, at least when I was growing up in the sports that I was interested in that really stood out to me. And do you think that actually affected what sports you wanted to play when you were younger? I know you mentioned you played soccer and swimming. Do you think that that was in effect at all? Yeah, um, I actually, in, I came to swimming late um, and I really didn't know like any women swimmers. I mean, you're like, Michael Phelps is like what you think of when you think of famous swimmers, right? And so it took me a while to actually see these different mentors like Simone Manuel or um, Katie Ledecky or Katie Miley who went to Columbia. It's a lot, um, like it's really kind of challenging to find those um, athletes. Uh, I think that in my sport, um, yeah, I saw a lot of, I saw a lot of men's soccer growing up. And so I wanted to be like a soccer player, like a boy soccer player. And so I think that like, yeah, that really kind of shaped that. And what would this representation have, have done for you in your career as a young swimmer? I think that seeing, like you said earlier, the, there's like the whole mantra of like, if you see her, you can be her. And I, think that if you if I had had that option to kind of be able to like be these um mentors then it could have like really driven my career differently and what do you think um that having more of that representation and how, how do you think that will affect young swimmers now yeah I think that more representation of women can show young women what they can become uh, fundamentally and that the more we're able to, to see different paths that we can take, the more um, you can like kind of expand your dreams and kind of be like, oh, I could do that, you know, instead of just being like, oh, that person's really good at that, but like, he's a guy or that person's really good at that, but she only got it like, cause she's super smart or super fast or, and just having more representation shows that like, there's so many people, so many women doing really amazing things. And that's like a total possibility for any young woman. And another audience question was how are women treated differently than men in swimming? Yeah, so I think that's a really good question. Um, and something that I really struggled with when I was growing up, because when you're um, a young girl swimming, it's all co-ed. And only once you move to college does it become separated um, uh, for some universities. Some some are still co-ed. But um, I think that it's like challenging um, to, I'm constantly comparing myself. And especially when you're always in the pool against boys, you're always comparing yourself to boys, which can be a really good thing, but can also be um, like a really big mental hurdle. Wow. And thank you so much for sharing. Your responses to all those questions, Claire, were so helpful and so inspiring. Max, are you ready for some questions? Yes, I am. All right. Well, when you look back at your childhood, what do you think you need to change from a media perspective to show more women in sports in powerful professions? Yeah, so 
as I grew up, I played softball since I was about six years old. And I grew up in a family full of softball players as well. I had a couple uh, two cousins, actually three cousins that went to college for softball. Um, and then my sister as well went to college for softball as well. So softball was definitely something that was going to be in my future. Um, that was no doubt about it. And it was great to have, you know, those women, um, to look up to you. And, you know, if they weren't out of reach, they were, you know, my family. So it was really interesting to see how they shaped my perspective, perspective of soft uh, sports. Um, and as I grew up, uh, softball is like a very, very big Olympic sport. Uh, there's not many professional leagues. There is just one and it's not hard. It's hardly ever covered on the media. So that was very difficult. I think, um, not being able to see, you know, these women competing professionally years after their college career really um, shaped my my own career because I always saw, you know, it was the end um, of my career after so, or after college, and so that was like really um, disheartening, knowing that like there was nothing going to be further um, for my career in softball after you know spending my entire life doing something that I love, and so that was really. Um, disheartening as I grew up but you know it still was also very I was very fortunate to have you know the women in my life and uh community the softball community especially in Southern California is um where I grew up and where I played um softball my entire life is a very big uh community of softball as well so seeing all the girls that came out of you know Southern California going on to Olympic um the Olympic team and professional leagues we always kind of you know kept um track of like where they went and going and seeing their games if we you know knew they were having something around like where our tournaments were at and stuff but um it definitely did make me feel a little less um hopeful for my future especially I think Claire had also mentioned like she wanted to be a part of like the men's soccer team and that's how I was because I mean baseball's on almost every single day um and seeing that compared to the little coverage that the women's professional softball league gets was just a big um, kind of smack in the face, you know, of being a woman. And so um, it it hurts, you know, it hurts a lot to see people that are so dedicated or just as much dedicated to the game as um, a man can be and just not getting the recognition for it. Wow. And we have another audience question for you. When did you get the confidence to be able to compete in sports, especially if you have a more reserved personality? And before we hear from Sienna for that one, please answer the poll question on your screen. What percentage of women hold senior management positions in the workforce? Now, Claire, what do you think about this one? Um, I think that this has really grown in the past few years. So, but I still think it's like, obviously under 50% because all of these options are under 50. Yeah, I know. Well, clearly because there's no like 4%, there's at least not one that's under 10. Clearly we're getting somewhere for this question, but Sienna, what do you think? Um, I want to say it's probably around 15%, unfortunately. Let's hope that grows more, but I think it's probably around there. Well, let's see. Let's, let's see the answers. Let's see the responses. What's it going to be? Oh, it looks like that the audience chose majority 29%, and that is correct. And sadly, again, correct, but still, amazing job, everyone. And Sienna, let's go back to what I was going to ask you before. Um, when did you get the confidence to be able to compete in sports, especially since you have a reserve personality? Um, I definitely got the confidence to compete in sports. I'd say probably um, the middle of middle school. Uh, when I was a kid, I was very tall, very awkward, very uncoordinated. I like could not keep my feet under me. I was all arms, all legs, all over the place. And sports really gave me confidence in myself as a girl. I feel like I was always so much taller than all of my friends, but also so much taller than all of the boys. I felt like I really stuck out and like not in a very good way. And I feel like sports gave me that confidence to be able to be myself and be able to compete and make friends and be who I really am. So I'm really grateful for sports to be able to give me that confidence in that way. Wow. 
that just shows, um, you know, the importance of having sports in your life and what it can do for you. So thank you so much for sharing that. And do you feel that there has been a heightened awareness these past few years around women in sports and women in high-ranking positions? Yes, I do think there has been um, more awareness around that. I feel like there's always stories that are coming out of, oh, there's a head coach in this position. There's a head female um, assistant coach here or a female owner of this team or female referees. You see all these stories coming out, but a lot of those headlines say first female head coach, first female referee. And for it to be 2021 and for those to still be the headlines just shows how far we still have to go when it comes to the representation of females in the sports industry. Well, at least they are the headlines, right? Yes, exactly. (laughs) What do you think can be done to keep this at the forefront of the discussion? I think the best thing that can be done is to listen to the voices of those women in those positions and girls like us, listen to them. They are the ones that we need to turn to and they are the ones that deserve to be heard when it comes to representation of women in sports. We need to listen to them, but we also need to be their biggest fans and biggest cheerleaders. We need to buy their jerseys, support their leagues, buy tickets to their games, follow them on social media, do all we can to support the organizations that they come out with because you see all these big name women in all of these sports. They have amazing organizations and they're doing a lot of great activism work. So to support those things and be loud about it, be loud about our support for female in sports and just show them as much support as possible. One of our viewers asked, how did you break out of the stereotype that girls can't be pro athletes? And what would you say to the young girl who maybe doesn't see her favorite female athlete on TV? Um, I am really grateful that I grew up in a household where there wasn't that stereotype of girls can't be pro athletes. Um, My mom was a track athlete in college and she had friends from college who went to the Olympics and won at the Olympics. So I always knew that women could compete on the largest stage in the world and win. And then also as I was growing up, my mom would take me to the Drake Relays, which is a um, a really high profile track event. Um, in Iowa, which was really great that we were able to just drive to an hour to go watch them. And there were college athletes there, semi-pro and professional athletes who I recognized from my TV when they were running in the Olympics. And they were accomplishing great things in every single one of their events. So I'm really grateful that I never had that stereotype. And I knew that those were goals that I could always reach for. And to the girl that doesn't see her favorite athlete on TV, do not get discouraged. I believe that times are changing and we're going to see a lot more female representation on our TVs. Um, But in the meantime, that means that we have the responsibility to seek out our favorite athletes. Maybe that's on a different streaming service. Go to YouTube, watch their highlights, follow them on social media, um, all of those things. There's ways to stay up to date and to watch your favorite athletes. So just because it's not on cable television doesn't mean they're not competing and doesn't mean they're still kicking butt in whatever sport they're playing. You just have to seek those out and find where to watch them. Max, what's your opinion on this? Yeah, I totally agree with Sienna. I honestly, from personal experience, I think I followed almost every one of my favorite softball players on Twitter and just kept up with every game that they had, every record that they broke. Um, I actually remember, um, I think the only time softball is super televised is when the College World Series comes around. Um, One of the, probably one of the most fan favorite um, tournaments that can come around for softball, um, which is always in Oklahoma, packed and all that stuff. Um, But just being able to like watch on TV and, seeing these girls perform at like a very, very high level. Um, I just like personally just always want to keep in touch with them. Um, so whether that's like, you know, meeting them um, at different events that they go to, uh, a lot of the times they'll come out and talk to us at certain tournaments, um, especially when we were younger. They love talking to um, the kids and trying to inspire us to do what they're doing. I remember one time, um, there was a former Olympian that I got to talk to and she was, you know, telling me like, if you want to be where I'm at, here's the steps, you know, go on this team, um, make sure that you are, you, you know, working hard. There's nothing that's impossible for you. And so that really made me happy. And I think, um, to the young girl, again, um, it's not, 
she's not invisible. Uh, you just have to go seek her out, as Sienna said. And eventually, I think that it could be you that is the one on TV. And don't be discouraged by not seeing yourself or um, another woman on TV, because that doesn't mean that it's not going to change. And Claire, last but not least, what's your opinion? Um, I, I totally agree with what Sienna and Max said. Um, I also think that she doesn't necessarily have to be on TV. Like she could be your teammate. And I think that that's something that I realized, um, pretty late, but that the people who have pushed me the most are my female teammates and the people who I look up to the most swim right next to me in the pool. I don't have to look anywhere for them. They're right there. And so I think like, look at your teammates, look at your female coaches, look at um, a teacher at your school, look at someone, it doesn't have to be an athlete, it doesn't have to be um, someone who's famous, like they're, they're everywhere. But I think, um, and if you can't find one, like reach out to one, like reach out to me, reach out to one of us because we are more than happy to be there for, to fill that space. And thank you all for your responses to that question. I thought that those were so helpful, and hopefully they'll be helpful to all the viewers listening. And now let's move on to the next segment and talk about what sports can teach us. You know, playing any type of game is fun, but have you realized that every time you're having fun, you're also learning something? Sports help you develop life skills, or in other words, they help you become you. Let's get right to it and ask another poll question. How many days a week do you get nine hours of sleep? Now, this is going to be a fun one, and I want to hear from all three of you on your responses to this. So let's start with Sienna. How many days a week do you get nine hours of sleep? Well, right now, uh, because I feel like things are a little more lax than they usually are when we're at school, I think I'm definitely probably getting it five to six days a week. But unfortunately, during school and when we're having games, I think it's probably more maybe one to two, maybe three days a week, nine hours, but not often. <laughs> and Max, what about you? Um, I think the greatest advice I got from a teammate was you better get eight hours of sleep or else. So um, I definitely am not a person that can, you know, go about um, not having eight hours of sleep. So um, usually I get it in nine hours. So during season and stuff, it's about three to five, which is very, very good compared to a lot of people at Columbia, just because of like um, the course load and homework and, you know, traveling and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I would definitely say three to five right now. It's a solid seven. <laughs> and Claire? Yeah, I think with swimming, um, for the swimmers out there, this is especially hard because you have a lot of 5 a.m. wake ups. So you're like going to bed at eight o'clock, which is like pretty challenging to do in college. Um, but during season, especially leading up to championships, I would have to say I'm like a solid six, but um, it, it varies otherwise. Sometimes I'm down to like two or three. <laughs> and Oh, well, I want to see what everybody's response is. I think we've got a very, oh, and it looks like one to two. Oh, no. <laughs> we need to get some more sleep. They get less sleep than we do. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. So there's a lesson learned that it's important to get at least nine hours of sleep, at least, yeah, I want to say at least five days a week. Because on the weekends, you can sleep in. So, I mean, those those days you should, for kids who are not in school, or I mean, who are not in college, you should at least be able to get, to get at least two days. Because on the weekends, everything is pretty chill. But one to two, I think we definitely need to get some more sleep. Mm -hmm. um, and Sienna, how do you feel about the way everyone answered? Um... Just like you, you said, I've, I'm like, wow, nobody's sleeping enough. I mean, I feel like nine hours is a lot. I feel like I typically try to shoot for around eight. Um, but yeah, get some more sleep, guys. Go to bed. <laughs> yeah, it's so important. And I know in our generation, a lot of people, a lot of kids just stay up all night on their phones. But mm -hmm. just know that your phone will be there when you wake up. <laughs> you can get some sleep. All right. Well, um, we had an audience member ask, how does sports help you develop the discipline and efficiency necessary to be both successful academically and athletically? Claire, do you want to answer this one first? Yeah, sure. Um, 
I think that this is, especially in college, but you kind of, as a young person, I think that you go through different evolving steps to this, that like middle school has more structure and then high school has more, but like you, you still get to like create your own schedule and everything. So I think that like, there's a good evolution to this. Um, but for sports, it really made me time management was the biggest thing for me of like, I need to get nine hours of sleep and I have to go to bed by 8 p.m. So I better get all of my homework done before six so I can eat dinner and wind down and everything. So I think that like that is really, really important. Um, and made I think like especially swimming be, being such a time-based sport, like everything's about time, always looking at the clock, every like every second counts. And so I think that that really translated into my life, sometimes in a bad way where I'm always like, oh, I have to get this done, where it's like, just relax, like it'll happen. But yeah, I think that it definitely shaped me a lot. Wow, and Sienna, what do you think about this? Yeah, so early on when I was deciding that I wanted to be a D1 basketball player, I had to completely focus and commit that to that goal. And that takes a lot of, dis that takes a ton of discipline. So um, during middle school, when I made that decision, I had to realize that I had to make some sacrifices to get things done. And just like Claire said, it took a lot of time management. And when I moved into high school, I, ha I was really grateful to have the opportunity that I could continue to be a multi-sport athlete. So in high school, I played basketball, I ran track, and then I also played soccer throughout all my four years. And during the spring season um, in Iowa, soccer is also a spring sport. So I played AAU basketball, I ran track, and I played soccer all at the same time. So that means I had a lot of things to manage on top of all of my schoolwork. So that gave me some really good time management skills moving into college to be able to stay disciplined to not only my sports, but also my academics, because my goal was to go play in the Ivy League. So I had to really stick to that and focus on whatever I was focusing on at the time. And Max, last but not least, what about you? Yes. So um, time management is for sure one of the key components of, you know, getting your stuff done um, and what softballs or like sports in general has really taught me. Um, you have your structured days, um, times of practices, times of lift, um, the small um, segments of time that you have between classes and stuff like that. So um I think that definitely helps, especially um, with a sleeper like me who likes to get lots of sleep um, of just trying to like fit in small, like little tasks um, in those breaks that you have. And so that's also like, that's been a very, very important um, aspect of my college career that I've taken on from softball or yeah, from softball to uh, college is just any kind of time that I've had um, growing up, it was always dedicated to softball, some type of, um, practice so whether it's hitting throwing um doing a small little workout um I do that all now um within a nice structure of time and so now I just do all the work that I have to do then um in those little increments that I got so um I definitely also just try to do everything as soon as possible because like um I think that's also an, a key thing is that you can't really just like procrastinate a lot is you just have to get it done make sure that um you know, you're keeping up with your work. And um, it also helps knowing that, you know, I might have a busy weekend. So just getting this done now will allow me to have like more of a relaxed time and not have to constantly like cram things or worry about them um, when I'm doing, you know, obviously playing softball on the weekends. Yeah. Well, after those responses, I think it's safe to say juggling time is one of the most important aspects of being a college athlete and being an athlete in general. Can you speak to some of the examples of all the different things you have to manage in your schedule, for example, class, early practice time, and traveling, etc.? Um, I'll go, yeah. So, I mean, thinking about my schedule when we were back in regular times before all this, I mean, it's you got to get in early to go to rehab. If you have any injuries, you lift, you practice, then you have recovery, then you have class, and then maybe you have office hours or tutoring. You have homework to do, studying, and maybe in there you have film to go to or a team meeting, and then that's and then you have to schedule in time to eat and time to sleep and time to visit with your friends because we all are college students. And then when it comes into season, you add in that time for traveling, pregame meals, shoot around, all that stuff, plus all the schoolwork 
for the classes that you're missing. So it's a lot of things to manage. So you have to plan out your days very specifically to get all of that stuff in because there's so much that goes into being a student athlete. Oh, Max and Claire, what about you? Do you have any other different things? I know Sienna just listed a lot of things <laughs> we have to handle, but is there anything else, Claire, Max? Yeah, so um, basically everything that Sienna said, I think um, we have to fly a lot up to places. So that is a very, very important part of just like knowing that you don't have Wi-Fi places as well. And so um, that's probably one of the things that you have to kind of like prepare for before you actually go on these uh, trips, especially like, you know, just downloading some of your um, readings so that you can read on the air, like the plane or uh, the bus. Usually the bus has uh, Wi-Fi, but it's sometimes a little uh, shaky, but um, yeah, just some stuff like that. Um, besides, you know, also trying to get um, rehab before and after practice, so smoke lifts, um, yeah, time to eat, basically everything that Sienna said. Um, but you kind of like figure out, like, I need to um, start preparing the day before or the week of um, to manage all of your work and uh, things that you have to get finished. And Claire, is there anything Sienna and Max left out? Yeah, I mean, I think they kind of covered everything, but one thing I would say is that like all this sounds really scary, but like it's not like it um, It makes sense when you're in it. Um, write things down, get a schedule like with pen and paper. Don't rely on your phone. Don't rely on your brain. It's gonna fall through. So like write things down um, and stick to a schedule, you know? Like if you always go see the trainer at 1.30, do that and like it'll it'll become ingrained and it'll become natural and there's definitely an adjustment and I feel like we're just speaking to college life in general right now but like <laughs> there's definitely an adjustment um but it all becomes natural and it's really fun and Claire when you're swimming it must be hard to see the competitors in the pool during the race that has to be challenging because you have to motivate yourself and push yourself without being able to see what's going on around you how do you overcome this yeah, so I mean, I definitely peak. Everyone peaks, even though they're not necessarily supposed to. Like when you're doing a flip turn or when you're breathing, you're definitely like kind of check it out, what's going on around you. But um, I think that that is a really also in practice. Um, swimming is hard because your head's underwater the whole time. Like you're not cheering on your teammates during the hard part of a set, you know, like you're racing them looking down at a black line. Like people are like, how do you, you know, <laughs> it sounds boring. But um, you get to the wall and you like have a few seconds to cheer on your teammates. And I think that like, that's also what makes it exciting is that like, you're, you're always getting ready to get to the wall and say like, hey, good job. And like, I think that there's a lot of self-motivation that comes too, because if you're doing like an hour long distance set where you have like two seconds on the wall and like you're just catching your breath and then going again, you, you, you really like look inside yourself. And I think that that's like a really big place for growth too, because like you can really learn, okay, if I do this, if I push this way and when I do this and it's like hard to get as distracted maybe as if you, as if like you had tons of teammates all around you, but yeah, it is challenging. <laughs> Sienna, um, what was the most difficult thing you've had to overcome in your athletic career so far and what did it teach you? Hmm, the most difficult thing I had to overcome. Um, well, this past season, I unfortunately broke my foot right before we were supposed to go to the Ivy League tournament. So that was really hard hitting. And now thinking back on it, like it didn't even happen. But at right then, it was so like heartbreaking because I'd never had a serious injury before. And it was right at the culmination of our season where we were going to go compete for our championships. So that was really hard to take in, but I realized that there's other ways to be a part of the team than just playing. There's other ways that you can contribute to a win than being on the court, scoring basket, making a pass. Like you can be the best teammate that you can be in practice and in games. And you can help your teammates when you notice something that they're doing in a practice or a game, you can be a voice on the bench and give positive energy. So that's definitely a struggle that I had to overcome. And that's going to really help me when we move forward and we get all together as a team again, is that voice that I was able to find when I was sitting out, I can translate that to when I'm playing on the court as well. Well, I can't wait to see that translate. And Max, 
Do you think your teammates struggle sometimes too? And what is the best advice for being a good teammate and helping each other through difficult times? Yeah, so um, mental health is very important to um, athletes in general. Um, female athletes, um, it's trying to be a little more um, verbalized and like just attention again. Um, I think there was a very, very important article that I had read about, unfortunately, a pen um, track runner who committed suicide um, and just with like the entire um, it challenges of, you know, an Ivy League school and also like a division one, um, a division one sport, it gets very overwhelming. So um, throughout my college career, I definitely have tried to you know, take care of my mental health and just advocating for myself and for my teammates, because I, we've, my coaches have been amazing about uh, mental health. And so they definitely try to get us, you know, with one-on-ones with um, the sports psychologists that we have at Columbia. And we just, you know, have a team meeting with them and talk about, you know, the struggles that we're all going through. We all have midterm season, which gets super overwhelming um, in the middle of like your own uh, academic or your own athletic competition season and that is just a bunch of things going around um, at once that you just don't know if you know your head will come up above the water and so that we all kind of you know vent and share our uh, experiences with and the best advice I can give as being a good teammate is just always, you know, um, checking on each other. I think we experienced that a lot um, within the past couple of years since I've been on the team is that change of, you know, really highlighting mental health issues and, um, you know, mental wellness, just trying to increase your mental wellness. And so I think the best thing that all of us kind of, you know, talked about, um, you know, and also just knowing individual teammates, like, okay, you're a self soother. And so you might not want, um, you know, to be asked necessarily what's wrong or, you know, a bunch of attention. They just need to, you know, deal with it themselves, but just knowing that you're there for them, a simple text saying, Hey, I'm here for you. If you need anything, I know you're going through a rough time. Here you go. Um, some other people might be different where they need that attention and um, just, you know, being there for your teammates, I think is really important. And I think that's the most important thing to, you know, help each other out during those difficult times. And let's go back to Claire. What was the most difficult thing that you had to overcome in your athletic career? And what has it taught you? Yeah, I think that for me, um, like I said before, comparing myself to guys, um, when, I think with with um, a lot of women, this also goes back to the exposure thing. Is that um, there are different standards, you know? Like you, you're out on the field, like playing soccer. Maybe I can get quicker and I can get faster, and my skills can get better. But with swimming, like the times are just different. Like no woman at the Olympics at the Olympics is going to be as fast as a man at the Olympics, um, and that's just something that I had to accept. And I think that that was really challenging to be like, I'm not going to be as fast but that doesn't make me worse. And I think that realizing that like stronger, bigger, faster does not mean better is like a really, really, really important thing that like, see how much your body can do. It's so powerful. It's so exciting. Like push it to its limits. And just because um, a man's times will always be better than my own doesn't mean that I'm not a better athlete or that I can't be a better teammate or that I can't push myself in different ways or push myself harder. doesn't mean they're more dedicated. doesn't mean that they practice more, you know? So I think that really realizing that that is, is an appropriate comparison, but not the important comparison is like, was the hardest thing for me to overcome. And I'm still, I learn every single day, like every, like about myself every day. And I think that like, this is something I'm still struggling with. Um, but just like noticing that like women's sports and men's sports are, are they're different things. And like comparison is always important, but it doesn't mean it can't be the only thing. Yeah, I definitely agree with Claire. I think just knowing your personal strengths um, is really important. I can speak from, you know, personal experience. I am not the most powerful um, hitter. I'm not going to hit a home run at every at bat that I take. But what I learned for myself personally was that I just, you know, need to do what I need to do. I'm not going to, you know, like I said, hit a home run every time or get 
doubles and triples. I, you know, know that my personal strength is just getting on base and, you know, getting solid hard hits. And so that's something that you also have to like take into consideration. You might not be the fastest, you might not be the biggest, like Claire said, but just know your personal strengths and just, you know, keep working at them because regardless of it, no one's going to be like you. And that always brings a special, unique um, value to your team and to your sport. And I think that's so important um, to think about that because um, yeah, like I said, I am not, I had maybe like four home runs in my entire college career. And, um, but I led in at batting average because that was something I was good at. And so just, yeah, sticking to your strengths is something that's really important and, you know, not comparing yourself to the girl next to you. Yeah. And I actually have faced some adversity in my almost 10 years of life. Um, and when I was in second grade, you know, I was bullied. And one of the things that I was told was that I was like too athletic. Um, and I turned, basically turned that on its face. And I made it into a message that I tried to share with my school and other kids. So w when they were bullied or if they were bullying people that they would know how it feels and that, you know, it's important to just get right back up and don't listen to what they say to you because they're just trying to bring you down, um, most likely because they're being put down by somebody else. So just continue to be yourself. Um, and turning it over again to Max for the final topic of the day. Max, can you talk about how softball has taught you the importance of teamwork and relying on each other, especially when facing adversity? Yeah, so... Um... I think, you know, um, I, I don't think I've ever had a problem with relying on my teammates. I think my teammates have always made it easy for me to trust them. Um, and especially days where, you know, I'm not doing well, I'm not producing. I, you know, don't even think about that because as long as my team is producing, then I'm happy. Um, being in our first championship series, um, you know, I wasn't as, you know, on my game as normal, but, you know, my team, it was the most amazing thing to see them pick me up and it just made me so happy. They were, you know, hitting balls left and right, making great plays and, you know, giving Harvard a run for their money. Um, and being able to see that just, I think increases your own, like, um, real, you know, your own trust in your teammates. And it might not be words, it might be actions, it may be words and not actions. But um, I think that teamwork has just been super important for obviously um, a softball team. And one thing that we always talk about is communication. Communication is the most important thing. Um, just knowing, you know, uh, where to be at a time of you know, certain situation with runners and, um, you know, different hitters and stuff like that, or pitch pitchers, like, um, you have different, everything's going on and you just always need to communicate every single pitch. And I think we do a really great job on that. And personally, I love to, um, just get one-on-one -on -one time with my teammates just to build that relationship, which I think is so important. Um, and I have seen it, you know, in my work. I also work on Columbia's um, campus uh, and my team at the ticket office is great. And I think every time I have, um, you know, bad days, they're always super helpful. And, you know, they take time to make sure I'm okay and pick up the slack if I'm, you know, not feeling 100%. And it has really helped me in a lot of different aspects as well as, you know, um, school too. So just being able to, you know, work in small groups, especially group projects that happens a lot at Columbia. Um, just being able to vocalize my own opinions and, um, you know, due dates and deadlines and uh, things that I think that we can, you know, all work on and stuff. So I really um, think that has really taught me a lot. Wow. And speaking of adversity, we had an audience member ask, could you give an example of when you were first starting your, in your sport and maybe you weren't in the starting lineup or you didn't make the middle school team? What was your mindset and specific efforts you made to improve and succeed? I can also speak about that. Um, going into my freshman year of college, I was um, competing against an upperclassman. And 
it definitely was hard with um, her, you know, experience being the starting third baseman um, at Columbia. And, you know, I wasn't starting for the few first month. And, you know, I was very upset um, as of course, but I didn't try to, um, you know, make excuses. I didn't try to say I wasn't good enough, never um, disabled or ever doubted my abilities. Um, but besides that, I just started, you know, um, really emphasizing a lot of the work that I put into practice and also um, those opportunities that I got um, the chance in this, you know, rarity at that time um, to do the best that I could. And eventually, starting I think our first Ivy League game um I was not hitting very well and my first at bat um I think I hit my first collegiate home run and so just knowing that pushing through that and it's not going to be you know the end of the world because I can always find ways to make myself into that um starting lineup was something that um you know made me realize that it was going to be a lot more of just my own capabilities and just performance. It was gonna be, you know, getting through that mental side as well of, you know, going from, you know, the bench to play. And so just turning on that like little switch in your um, in your head is super important. And it honestly like really helped and encouraged me to keep, you know, pushing through. And can you all share some of your thoughts on each of your biggest champion over your careers and how they've supported you? Sienna, we'll start with you. Um, I would say my biggest champions who kept pushing me and supported me throughout my whole career so far as an athlete definitely be my parents. Um, they would drive me to my AU practices an hour away multiple times a week, spent countless, countless hours in gyms all across the Midwest, driving 10 plus hours to whatever tournament here and there each weekend. Um, my parents saw things in me on my worst days where I couldn't see any potential in myself. And when I felt like I couldn't push myself towards my goals, my parents were always there to support me and tell me that I could do it. So I am so grateful for them. Their continuous support for me, wherever my life takes me is something that I'll always really, really be thankful for. So it's definitely my parents. And Claire, who's your champion? Yeah, my parents are my champions <laughs> too. Um, I think, yeah, like Sienna said, um, sometimes I like don't understand what they see, <laughs> you know, like you can't see it when you're in it. Um, but they just were really, even when I was having a, a tough time in school or swim and just being like, this will pass and you're putting in so much hard work that something good will come out of this. And even if I can't see that, they can and having that outside perspective really kind of has changed everything and they're like I love them so much they're the greatest <laughs> yeah and Max what do you think about this one um yeah so definitely top um champion would probably be my mom um she got me to and from every single practice um agility um and games. Um, I definitely would say my sisters as well. They always were the ones uh, taking me out for extra work um, and practice and always giving me just like their experience um, and trying to help me learn from what they've learned. And then also my, um, my late grandfather, he was just my number one fan, uh, regardless if he had no idea what was going on. He just knew that I was a superstar and that um, I was going to do great. And so the, the, all of them were big champions of my life. So I couldn't just pick one. I had to pick all of them. <laughs> I also think quickly, um, I've had some like fantastic coaches who have really transformed my life. Um, even I think that it's kind of challenging when you're growing up because um, I don't know about you guys, but you, you switch a lot, you know, you have a middle school coach, you have a high school coach, maybe you also have a club coach and then you get recruited and you have a college, you know, so it's like a lot of different factors, but really grab hold of the ones that really speak to you. Because sometimes I had coaches that knew me better than myself, knew my limits better than I did and would say, you can keep going or like, you need to rest. And sometimes you don't know it, but like those people are really transformative. Thank you to all of those who submitted questions, but we have three more. 
Pepper, we wanted to thank you so much for hosting today and being a prime example of why representation matters so much for young girls. And with that, we have a couple questions for you. Max, you want to start? Yeah. So who inspired you to become an uh, interviewer slash journalist slash little activist that you are? Um, I think um, a lot of the time it was, well, one, I feel like it was my dad because for a while um, he had a blog um, and he actually stopped having his blog so he could take care of me. Um, and so, I mean, I would say he's one of the champions of my life to go back to the last question that I just asked you. But I think partly seeing him um, doing a little bit of journalism and then just seeing um, the WNBA and what they're doing, and not necessarily that they like were journalists because they're not. Some of them aren't, and so. But I think it was just like that. I was so curious about what they did and how they did it, and so I just wanted to know. And so that's really how my career got started. But also, as I've gotten older, it's evolved more into being less about me and my curiosity and more about bringing attention to the league or sharing um, the importance of activism and stating your, your voice and standing in your power. And so I think that's really how it started for me. That's wow, awesome. I love that. Um, I have a question as well. So I know that you have met and interviewed some amazing female athletes in your life so far. It's so cool. Um, who are you most excited or nervous to meet and interview? Um, I think that I always feel nervous, um, which I know um, sounds kind of funny because I was saying that um, to one of my friends who was asking me, like, how do you all, how are you always not nervous? I'm like, actually, I am always nervous. Um, I just feel like I've been lucky enough to, for the people that I've been talking with, they're always so generous. And so they honestly make me feel comfortable. And then it's like we're having such genuine conversation. Um, but I would have to say the favorite person that I have met is, was, um, I have to say, Michelle Obama, because from the very pretty much beginning of my existence, I had wanted to meet her because she is just at the top of the list of being a black female boss. And so I wanted to meet her so bad. And when it actually came, um, she uh, at Barnes and Noble, she was doing a book sign for her book signing for her book. Um, my dad was there as well. And I was just Hi, I had to do like all these things to just calm myself down because I didn't want to, it was also in the morning, so I didn't want to wake up the whole world by doing my classic squeals, which is what I always do when I'm excited. Um, but, you know, it was just a really amazing moment. And you'd think because she's so famous and so well known, like sometimes I felt scared that like, what if she's not nice? But she was so nice. It was amazing. And my favorite person that I have interviewed Ugh, um, ah, ah, I would just say, um, I feel one very lucky to have interviewed all the people that I have, and I'm grateful for all the opportunities that I've had. Um, and I'd have to say, just this summer, speaking with all the WNBA players, um, I mean, it was just such an amazing to learn from them because, of course, my dream is to play in the WNBA, but also just to be more from them, be more aware about what's going on in our society because, of course, my parents always keep me aware. But there are some things that just hearing it from the people who are, like, really experiencing it, like, experiencing what it's like to be a, a grown black woman and to be seeing people who look just like you being um, brutalized by police. It's just really hearing it from them, from the people who really feel that experience has been um, incredible for me. Nice. Um, yeah, and... Uh, Oh, sorry. I was just had one follow up. That's really cool. Who are you diving dying to meet next? Like who who's on your radar for next person? Um you know what? I really need to think about that because there are so many people, but I think right now, and I know this is a big get, um, but I would say Kamala Harris because she, yeah, she's definitely up there for me. Um, I don't know if it's ever going to happen. I mean, now that things are virtual, it's probably more likely, but I mean, if I can meet Michelle Obama, maybe I can meet her. <laughs> um, my question is, what could young women like myself do to be better mentors or create a better community for younger girls like you? Um, well, firstly, 
um, having more of these conversations. Because I feel like um, a lot of the time people are scared. They said, oh, no one's going to watch it. And yes, actually, especially now when social media is so prominent, girls will be watching. And being able to see the three of you, I know if I was a viewer, it would mean so much. And so just honestly trying to put yourself out there firstly because a lot of the times I know um, I believe Claire you talked in the beginning about how you have to actually like search and find the the people that um, you want to to meet but a lot of the time um, as as a young girl I I really feel like nervous that when I search and find I'm gonna find nothing and then that's just gonna be more disappointing than not actually knowing so just trying to put yourself out there is I think really one thing that would be really really helpful but I think that there are so many female role models now that um, we we've gotten a really really far distance but we just need one more push and we need a little bit more representation of women out there Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I mean, what a wonderful discussion. Um, Pepper, Claire, Max, Sienna, Amanda, and I really appreciate you guys being here. And thank you everyone who tuned in um, to hear our discussion. You guys are awesome. Remember to go follow us on our Go Go Columbia, Go Columbia Lions on Instagram, Facebook, just so you can keep up to date with everything that's going on and what other webinars we have in store here um, in the near future. So thank you again to everyone and we hope to see you soon. Well, thank you all so much for watching. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.